Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. We're glad if you're joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Pastor Rebecca Richards and I have the joy of uh, serving with you all here in the city of Albany. Um, a few things. Today we celebrate the sacrament of baptism. Um, Riley Lumella will be baptized this morning, so we welcome her into the family of faith, as well as we welcome all of you who are joining us for the baptism this morning. A few other announcements. Um, on September 17th, there will be a trustees meeting in the parlor at 7 p.m. And um, our first announcement, the church conference conference this year will be held at Newtonville United Methodist Church at 4.30 p.m. on October 12th. Um, you'll notice that there is a list of volunteers that are needed for the office. Um, please see me if you are able to help with any of those items, particularly liturgists and communion stewards. That we are in a great need of, of people to help with those items. Um, reading scripture in, in the service, as well as setting up for communion once a month um, before the service. Now let us set our hearts and minds on God, God's word, and let us join together in song, singing hymn number 581, verses 1 through 3. Lord, whose love through humble service. Ooh. Please join me in the call to worship. What good is it if we say we love all people, but give special treatment to a few?
What good is it if we say we want God to show mercy towards us, but are quick to judge others? What good is it if we say we trust God in every moment, but live guided by our fears? Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy One, our Maker, we gather to worship you, to renew our spirits, and to connect as a community. Some of us crave a joyful noise. Some of us flourish in quiet contemplation. Others desire movement, while others need to ponder our thoughts. However we worship, we gather here. In this place, we find you in the midst of us. In this connectivity, we covenant remains in effect. May your spirit guide, empower, and speak. Amen. And now let us greet one another as God's people, saying the peace of Christ be with you. Would the children like to come forward? All right, I'm going to change what I was originally going to do because the person 
at Pauling did something very similar <laughs> to the children's sermon I had planned, but it's going to work better because we have a very special occasion. So I want you guys to turn around here and I want you to look up here. Just look. Do you see what this is? Yeah, it's water. And we see a bowl. And we see a candle, right? So today is a very special day in the life of the church. We are going to baptize somebody. We're going to baptize Riley Lumella. And that is going to bring her into the family of God in, in essence. Now, what we call baptism, you want to see, you want to see, oh, that's all that there is. Baptism, let's go back and sit down. Baptism is a really cool because it symbolizes God's love in a very special way. My, now for the adults, my theology, my Worship professor, Lawrence Stuckey, who was a wonderful, wonderful man, always used to say baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. So what does that mean? We are born with God's grace, each and every single one of us. God loves us so much that we are born with this grace inside of us. And when we are baptized, that is simply just a symbol of that love, of that grace for us. That God loves us, God cares for us. And then the church makes a big promise. The church makes the promise that they are going to help this person, because we usually baptize babies. Sometimes we baptize adults. But we are going to help that person realize God's grace. Realize how much God loves them throughout all of their lives. And that's a really, really cool thing to celebrate. It's a birthday of sorts. And I know Lumella's birthday was last week, right? She turned one last week. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a birthday of sorts as well. And we also have the candle, the baptism candle. And that is about light being shared with the world. We're going to say some words, so I hope you'll stay in here for the baptism and watch and listen very closely to the words of the baptism because all of it is God, about God's love for us. We tell the stories. We tell about when Noah built the ark. We tell about in, in the baptismal service. And all of that, all of those stories that we tell during baptism were all parts where God showed God's love for us, God's covenant with us. Should we pray? God, we give you thanks for Lumella, Riley, Riley Lumella, her life and her baptism today. What a celebration that we have because we know that you love us so much. And this baptism is a sign, a sign for us of your love. Amen.
please stand as you are able to sing hymn number 434, When the Poor Ones. Please be seated. The first lesson this morning is from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and then 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, believers in Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith 
and to inherit the kingdom he promises to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into the court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbors as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as, your law, as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sister, sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. The second lesson today is from the book of Proverbs 22, verses 1 through 2, 8 through 9, and 22 through 23. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice reaps calamity, and the rod they wield in fury will be broken. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in court, for the Lord will take up their case and will exact life for life. This is the word of God for the people of God. So for the next four weeks, we are going to take a look at wisdom literature. Now, I got back from vacation and I almost took the easy route and said, we're not going to take a look at wisdom literature because it's hard. And the gospel was very tempting because it's the gospel of Mark. And if you know anything about me, I love the gospel of Mark. I've studied it. I know it. But wisdom, not as much. So first, what is wisdom literature? Wisdom literature tends to be a a bit more reflective. It's more poetic in nature. It's more descriptive. It doesn't tell a story. It also doesn't have a, theolo a particular theological agenda. But the goal of wisdom literature seems to be an invitation for all of us to use what God has given us as tools to think about, to contemplate God. These scriptures in particular invite us to look a little bit differently at the world around us. To look at the world around us through God's eyes rather than our eyes. And so today, in, very concise, in a very con concise and clear set of verses from Proverbs, we consider the theme of justice. Not judgment, but justice. As with most Proverbs, these are qu quick, and they get right to the point, which makes them very memorable. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. 
Those who are generous are blessed. I realize that at first glance, it realized that there is a lot, that it sounds like there's a lot of judgment in there too. But I don't think that is what God is trying to get across. I think that justice, that this justice that God was calling his people to practice is what these verses are actually about. And I think that that justice was more along the lines of compassion and mercy than judgment. The primary motivation for it was the fact that God has shown us mercy and compassion. Therefore, we should show others mercy and compassion. But I think that the reason that we stay away from wisdom literature, that we stay away from this idea of justice found in the wisdom literature is because it is so hard. The very essence of what God expects from the people who claim to be God's people is to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God from Micah 6.8. I am not sure we know what to do with that verse because we tend to think of justice in terms of crime and punishment. So it is hard for us to reconcile justice with mercy because, our, because in our minds, they seem to be the opposite of justice and mercy. But in the Hebrew Bible, nothing could be further from the truth. The practice of justice and the practice of mercy are one and the same. They go hand in hand like faith, hope, and love. The Hebrew Bible makes it clear over and over again that justice is about ensuring well-being or shalom for everyone, peace. It is about a way of life that makes it possible for everyone to thrive, not just a privileged through few. But if you look at and if you look at the key pa- at key passages in the Hebrew Bible, you'll find that justice is about lifting up those who have been beaten down. It's a way of life de- defined by compassion and generosity. The Bible gets very specific about this. Justice means taking care of orphans and widows who have no one else to take care of them. It means welcoming immigrants. It means feeding the hungry, not blaming their bad choices for their lot in life. It's about supporting the sick with, compassion, with a compassionate presence and comforting those who are grieving. It is mercy in action. Justice calls us to defi- deny oneself Take up your cross and follow me. It calls us away from a life that is lived solely for our own benefit to a life that is lived for the benefit of others. And I don't think we really like that. Proverbs 22, 2 carries this idea one step further. The wealthy may appear to be different from the poor, but the poor... But that difference is only an illusion. It is only an illusion. God has made all people, both rich and poor, and everyone, according to Proverbs, is under God's care. This is hard for us to understand. This is another way of describing life in the kingdom A justice-oriented society where all, not just a few, thrive. Although it consists of mercy, 
God's justice tends to be hard for us because it exposes our selfishness and calls us to relate to others with mercy and compassion. But it is nevertheless a justice of mercy. It always has been and always will be. Justice that consists of mercy must seem like an oxymoron to us. Our version of justice is to some extent the exact opposite of the justice of mercy. So it doesn't surprise me that we live in a world where we simply cannot understand this mercy of God's justice. Mercy triumphs over judging, James 2 verse 13 says. And this makes no sense in a world where we're constantly evaluating and measuring up, criticizing and condemning. One reason we Christians are so unfamiliar with this concept of justice is because we often think that the New Testament does not speak the same language as the Hebrew Bible does. For that reason, it is easy for us to get confused and to think that the Hebrew Bible is a book of law and commandments, obedience and judgment. We must prefer the New Testament as a book of grace and compassion. But that kind of understanding is a vast misunderstanding. The Hebrew Bible is just as much a book about grace and love and mercy as the New Testament is. And the New Testament is just as much a book about obedience and justice. They just use different words to talk about it. It seems to me that the way the New Testament talks about doing justice is that is you shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that this was the heart of God's command. And in fact, in this, Jesus is following the law, the Torah of the Hebrew Bible, because he is quoting from the book of the law, the book of Leviticus. If we were to take time to look at Leviticus 19, where this commandment comes from, we would find that loving your neighbor is defined in very down-to-earth terms. For example, loving your neighbor is about leaving the gleanings from your field for the poor. It is about dealing honestly with others. It is about honoring the handicapped. It is about not slandering others, not hating them, not seeking revenge. All of that sounds like justice to me. And that is why this wisdom literature is so hard. First, it gives us a glimpse of how God sees the world, and then it reminds us that our actions do, in fact, have consequences felt in this insecurity that we feel in this world from our workplace, to our schools, to, our, to the polit current political arena. It feels like thing, things are simply not the way that they are supposed to be. It certainly doesn't feel like we are thriving as a society. Perhaps we are in this situation, not in spite of all that we're doing, but precisely because of how we are living, what we are doing. If you take a close look at our way of life, I think it's hard not to conclude that we as a people are sowing injustice all around us. We ought not to be surprised then when we reap the calamity that goes with injustice, as Proverbs 22, eight says. So how do we change things? What can we do to make a difference? I think we start by asking ourselves, what does justice look like? And for me, it seems like 
Jesus' whole life was one of sowing justice. Whether it meant healing a Gentile woman's daughter, even though both of them would have been despised by most, most of the Jewish population of their day, or whether it meant caring for a person who could not speak and could not hear, who would have been very easy to overlook and ignore. Jesus' life was dedicated to caring for those who were the least and the left out, the passed over and the shut out. And so for me, I often imagine a common meal, a table to which everyone is graciously welcome to share the bread of the one who sees and meets the, the need by inviting the poor to his or her own table, by nourishing the dignity of all, as well as meeting their basic needs. This is a different model of justice. Inclusion at the table. And today, we see God's grace at work in the sacrament of baptism as we bring yet one more in to this world of justice. The scriptures over and over again make it clear that God, clear God's call that we who have experienced mercy are to extend mercy to one another. That is essentially our calling. We who have experienced mercy, we who have experienced God's love, we who have experienced God's grace are to extend that to everyone we meet. From Genesis to Revelation, God's call to us is one of justice. A justice defined by compassion and mercy towards others especially the least and the lost and the left out. There is simply no other way around it. So the question that we have to ask today is this. When will we stop ignoring this teaching of scripture, of justice, and start walking humbly with our God? May God grant us the courageous faith to take that question to heart and take that first step. Amen. Let us pray. Actually, before I forgot, prayer concerns. This is, we're trying something new. Um, I'd like to raise up Amy, uh, Amy Jane Steiner um, was admitted to the hospital after a surgery on Friday. She had had surgery, so we keep Amy Jane in our prayers. Um, also, this week there was another school shooting. So in in Georgia. Um, so we continue to pray for an end to all of this violence that we see, especially as our own um, students started school this week. Um, and we pray for students going back to school. It's a different kind of classroom that they are, that they are studying in. Are there any others? For Jeannie's mother, continue to pray. All right, let us set our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, 
We come to you with hearts that need to be opened to your love. There is so much around us that tears at us and causes us pain. Keep us mindful of your presence and the hope that you have given us in the example of your son, Jesus. Guide us, we pray, as your church. Keep us focused on the mission and ministry to which you have called us and lead us forward. We know, oh God, that there will be bumps and holes in the road along the way. God, help us from dwelling on them and make us more secure in the goals that you have given to us. God, hear our prayers for all who need your tender touch of healing in their lives, the names that we have said today, and the names that we name before you, you each day, as well as those who are known only to you in the depths of our hearts. Be with everyone who is mourning, May all of us remember the love and, the, and grace your people have brought to our world. God, we pray for your creation. Always at odds at one another. Guide our leaders and the leaders of other nations that this world might truly be as you created it to be. A world of peace, hope, love, and justice. God, these are our prayers. Together with those that lie in the hearts of all your people, which we offer to you in the spirit of Jesus. Amen. And now, with the confidence of God's people, we join together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray for this morning's offering. We give because you have been generous to us, gracious God. We give to realize your image within us. We give to feed the hungers of body and soul that are all around us and deep within. May the ministries of this church meet the needs of our members, our community, and our world. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. And now I would invite those who are to be presented for baptism this morning to please come forward. Can open. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without a price. And so I present to you this morning Riley Lumella for baptism. And so I ask the parents and the godparents, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Will you nurture this person in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, answer, I will. And now I ask of the congregation, do you as Christ body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? 
Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include Riley now before you in your care? With God's help, that she we will pray for her we may be true disciples and walk in the way that leads to that so now let us join together in profess professing the christian faith as it is contained in the scriptures of the old and new testament do you believe in god the father i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth do you believe in jesus christ who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as sla slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land where you promise. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a, of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make the disciples to all the nations. Declare his work to the nations, his glory among all people. Pour out your Holy Spirit and bless this gift of water and those who receive it to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and for the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Hi. Hello. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Riley. Amen. Amen. Ah. So this light, this light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. This child who has been enlightened by Christ as well, so that she may always remember to walk as a child of the light. And so now it is a joy and an honor to welcome our new sister in Christ through your baptism. You are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Jesus Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, 
we welcome you as a member of Christ new Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend Riley to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. Thanks to all that God has already given you and welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. And now let us join together in singing hymn number 611. I'll invite all of you to go back and let's introduce Riley to the congregation. So if you all will walk with me down the aisle and we can introduce Riley to the congregation. So... <laughs> Yeah, you, you all see. But she'll, she'll stay. And we'll stay. Go ahead. <laughs> We go back by star? Yes. We'll go back. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. So now God sends us forth to love all people. No strings attached. And we will share grace and hope with everyone. Jesus sends us forth to forgive our sisters and brothers. We will offer mercy, not judgment, to those around us. The Spirit sends us forth to trust God in every moment. We will live in faith, not in fear, sharing our hearts with all we meet. And so we go in peace to love and serve. Amen. <laughs> 